Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Pruitt. I'm president of Radical Exchange Foundation. And just to kick off the talk today, I will, um, I will welcome our host, uh, Glenn Weil. Um, uh, so today's talk is called uh, Navigating Digital Identity in Political Economies. A uh, quick reminder to everyone to please get involved in the conversation by asking questions on Slido. So if you're on the radicalexchange.org website, you should be able to see uh, uh, Slido to the right of the of the talk. And you can tweet us at, um, at RadExchange on Twitter. Um, so... I would like to welcome our moderator, Glenn Weil, who currently serves as Microsoft's Office of the Chief Technology Officer, Political Economist, and Social Technologist, which uh, turns out as an acronym to the OCTOPEST, where he helps us uh, design and implement uh, technology uh, and ambitious corporate social commitments. Um, I, I think most of you are, are, are aware of Glenn as the founder of Radical Exchange Foundation. And uh, with that, welcome, Welcome, Glenn, and looking forward to today's talk. Thanks, Matt. Um, and I, in turn, uh, want to welcome the rest of the panel. So first, we have Brian Ford, who's an associate professor at the uh, EPLF, e EPFL, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne. Um, and he leads their decentralized and distributed uh, systems research lab. And he's a leader, uh, leading thinker on topics of security, uh, digital democracy, blockchain, in particular uh, issues around liquid democracy and proof of personhood, which we'll be talking about today. Um, and he's the author of a recent um, paper, Identity and Personhood in Digital Democracy, Evaluating Inclusion, Equality, Security, and Privacy in Pseudonym Parties and Other Proofs of Personhood Schemes. And, um, that will be a particular uh, focus for our discussion, discussion today. So welcome, Professor Ford. Thank you. Um, next, I want to welcome Shireen Mitchell. She's an American entrepreneur, author, uh, technologist, and diversity strategist. She founded Digital Sisters slash Sistas, uh, the first organization dedicated to bringing women of um, and girls of color in tech um, online access and stop online violence against women, which is a project that addresses uh, laws and policies that provide protection uh, to women online. Recent projects include Tech Media Swirl and uh, Human First Tech, and she's earned all sorts of accolades, including being one of Fast Company's most influential women in technology. She's a native New Yorker, and we're very happy to have you, Shireen. Thanks for being here with us. Um, and then finally, uh, I want to welcome a longtime friend and collaborator, uh, Kalia Young, who often goes by Identity Woman. Um, perfect person to have in this conversation. She's probably the world expert on sort of decentralized pluralistic identity technologies within and outside of the blockchain. In fact, before blockchain was a thing. Um, she's the co-author of the Comprehensive Guide to Self-Sovereign Identity. Um, and she's committed her life to developing uh, communities around open standards for the internet. Um, again, she's one of Fast Company Magazine's most influential women in technology. And she's currently the chair of the in, um, Interoperability Working Group for Good Health Pass at the Trust Over IP Foundation um, and a number of other uh, uh, leading standard setting groups. Um, thanks so much uh, for being here with us, Galia. Thanks, okay, Glenn. great. Um, so why don't we get started? Um, so I thought a useful way to uh, run this conversation would be to sort of, um, with a focus on Brian's thinking about these questions and our reactions to them, but also bringing in other people's perspective, just walk through things from kind of a very high level down to a much more granular one. So I just wanted to start with the word identity. And I know that uh, Brian sort of, this is not necessarily the word that he's focused on, but I was interested in what, what that word means uh, to you or what other word you would use in terms of what you're going after here as the first question, Brian. And then I'd love to get Kalia and Shireen's response to that and, and maybe their own sense of what identity in the context of uh, digital systems mean. 
Oh, sure. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, of course, identity is a very vague term that, you know, I don't know, I, you know, uh, I, I don't think has a precise definition. Um, but, you know, what, what I generally understand identity to mean, especially in the digital space, is, um, you know, what our various attributes are as, uh, you know, as people, right? you know, kind of what, uh, what I've done, what I've accomplished, our, uh, you know, could be our demographics, where we're from, what our citizenship, you know, attributes, right? Um, uh, uh, and, you know, of course, that's, uh, you know, that, that's not a big enough definition, but that is what I see the primary focus on when I see identity in the digital space, especially the, you know, in self-sovereign identity concepts, things like that. Um, it's about, you know, what we, what we are, what we have, you know, um, what distinguishes us from other people, what discriminates one person from another, um, you know, is, uh, is our identity, right? Uh, um, uh, uh, and, you know, what, what I am that you're not, what I have that you don't, what I've achieved that you haven't, you know, that kind of things and vice versa, of course, right? Um, and so, and that's, that's precisely, you know, the, the concept of identity that I like to, uh, to contrast with a notion of personhood or digital personhood, uh, you know, which I see as focused uh, on, you know, what we are as people, what, what basic rights should we, that, you know, we should have as people online, independent of any attributes, right, independent of any uh, differences. Uh, great, thank you. Um, Kalia, uh, Shireen, does one of you want to jump in first? Sure, I'll, I'll go next. Um, so I, uh, I always find it interesting when, when this question comes up because um, I always, uh, when I listen to other people's interpretation, um, I always feel this, this distance that people want to have with identity. And I, I don't like from the work that I do and the way that I perceive it, it's like, there's no way to separate myself. Um, the, um, the difference between digital identity and my, in my opinion and the way in which we think about identity as a whole is as if we are saying, uh, it's, it's very, like it's, I, I'll, this is gonna probably fall out more as we talk, but like, as if we're trying to take all the pieces that we are and still categorize them individually for data points as if none of that is our human condition or our experiences. Like as if those data points and those, those, those pieces that are out there in the net are somehow um, uh, things for the machine to churn and separate from the person that we are and all the pieces that make us that. Um, so when I hear the personhood thing, I think about um, the, the concept of when when I hear that, I, I feel like that's another example where we're trying to pull away from uh, pull away from the person and the things that that do that that do make us unique and distinct. Um, I think I think a lot of times we're debating this sort of individualism from the group dynamic in, in many ways from a digital perspective. And to me, that's kind of why we keep getting caught in this. And um, I do believe in the principles of self sovereign, you know, self sovereign identity. Um, but I also think about it from a very specific, a very focused um, way. I, I think you can't solve for a lot of the problems in the digital space without making sure that you have the whole person and all the pieces that they have and not just the data points. And I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. That's great, Shireen. Thank you. That was really helpful. Um, Kalia? So um, one of, I, I think about... Um, the things Shireen mentioned, but also this question of the architectures underneath them, right? So if we're going to talk about identity in the digital space, we end up touching into the technical, which is like, what are the identifiers that we use in digital space? And how do those identifiers, like the addressable endpoints for us, examples we all know are like an email address or a phone number, right? But there's a next generation of identifiers that are being innovated to support some new capacities online. And um, how do we both hold like the person, but also address the kind of 
technical affordances that are in our systems when we are talking about what it means to be digital online. It is not just our attributes. And by the way, there is an official ISO definition of identity that is you are your attributes. And and I have, and others in our industry have pushed back against this and said, well, we're a lot more than our attributes. And what about those identifiers that we may or may not have control over or agency over in how we navigate digital space together? Well, um, Shireen and Klee, you've both a bit declined to actually offer a definition. So let me try to offer a definition that I would use and see whether you agree. I think it is hopefully consistent with everything that you guys have said, but maybe not. And if not, push back against me. So I would say that our identity is the set of social facts that jointly constitute our sense of self. Do you, anyone want to re react to that? But it sounds like it's still person and not the data attributes. Social facts sounds like data to me. To me, it sounds like you're just proposing a, a different rephrasing of the attribute focused, uh, you know, view concept of identity, which I, I have to agree with both Shireen and Kayla, you know, seems like a very reduct, overly reductive you know, perhaps, uh, you know, definition of identity as a broad concept, but that that seems to be, you know, identity as attributes or social facts, you know, seems to be what the, the digital identity industry has re re reduced identity to, right? And, you know, and if that's what identity is, then, then I feel like building digital identity before digital personhood of, of some kind, uh, you know, just the, our very uniqueness and existence as people, then we're build, we're trying to build the walls of a house before building the foundations of a house and it's, it has to collapse, right? In, in my book, Glenn, I have a little diagram um, of what I think one way to look at identity is who a person is informs how they present themselves to the world. And this could both be in person form or in digital form, which informs how other people perceive them, which in turn informs who they are. So that like in with that um, little diagram, I, I am agreeing with you that, that, that identity is not something that individuals create alone by themselves in isolation, that they do so in the context of their social relations. So yeah. So I, 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 I don't, I, it seems to me that that is basically. Uh, I, I hope we can proceed with that, but I, but I'm, I, I just like I'm trying to be crisp because I, I we're, we've got a lot of people who are outside of this, and we actually need to give them an entry point. Um, so I understand that's what how I think about it, um, and it sounds like that's how how Shireen and Clea think about it. It seems like Brian, on the other hand, uh, has has something else he wants to focus on, which is a notion of distinct humanity as being a, a focal uh, issue beyond these other socially constituted elements. So we can go on to explore that some more. Um, the second uh, question I have is, if we're gonna build digital identity systems, what are some desiderata that you have for them? And, and again, Brian, for you, that might just be digital personhood systems, but I, I, I wanna, talk through the goals that we have for these systems and see what uh, your thinking is about this. Uh, uh, so you want me to go first again? Sure. Um, yeah, so, so uh, to me, the, the most, uh, you know, there, there are many goals that I think, you know, we need to, to address, but the most fundamental, you know, uh, that, that uh, you know, is completely lacking in the, in the online ecosystem is uh, the ability to handle, uh, to, to allow online communities to self-govern in a people-focused way, in a one-person, one-vote fashion, right? Because, you know, because, um, uh, you know, basically because of the Sybil attack, because accounts are, you know, completely fakeable. Right, and let's not assume people know what Sybil attack means. So, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so it, it, you know, goes by many names. Uh, Sybil attack is a computer science term. Um, but, you know, the fact that, 
Um, you know, anyone can, can create any number of accounts, profiles, um, uh, you know, pseudonyms, whatever, whatever you want to call them. And this can be increasingly highly automated uh, through, um, you know, through simple algorithms or more sophisticated, say, deep fake technology that can, you know, that can create lots of, you know, convincing, you know, human-like profiles uh, that even, you know, engage in social media, push fake news, et cetera, right? So, you know, this is uh, the, the fact that more and more of the people, the profiles or accounts online are, you know, fake in some way, um, makes it basically impossible to count, you know, to count anything, to count votes, to count reputation, to count likes, follows, you know, anything that's supposed to represent people online uh, you know, those are all unreliable and, you know, increasingly unreliable. Everybody knows that they're unreliable. And those have all of being able to do those things, be able to vote or, you know, count likes or follow follows or just deal with abuse of fake news and things like this. This does not depend on knowing people's identity, right? This depends merely on being able to distinguish real people uniquely from fake people, from, from fake accounts or fake profiles, right? So to me, this is the, this is the you, know, you know, so, so you know, digital identity in, in the form of attributes, you know, that you might prove, you know, the kinds of things that self-sovereign identity focuses on, that's the kind of thing you need to prove that you're old enough to buy a beer or to prove that you have a certain degree in order to, to demonstrate to a potential employer or something like that. But, you know, what, what I, you know, call digital personhood is what, is what you need to, to, you know, be political online, to have anything you know, in terms of self-governance or reputation work online. And that fund fundamentally does not need us to, you know, give up all our, uh, all our privacy, to disclose everything or even anything about us, right? And so, uh, so that's, that's why, you know, I, I've, been, I've been saying, you know, starting with, you know, identity as being able to prove attributes and things like that, is the cart pulling the horse, right? First, we need to be able to, you know, as a baseline, just prove ourselves real unique people for the purposes of, of self-governance, voting, you know, kind of getting, uh, getting our, you know, online society in, uh, you know, in some basic order. And then let's talk about, be, uh, you know, differentiating ourselves, proving attributes and things like that. Right? So Brian, what I hear you saying is, we need a support for some sort of a one person, one whatever principle exactly. based on mm -hmm. people. I have yep. my own di differences from that, but I'd love to hear Shireen and Kalia's reactions and then uh, maybe I'll circle back. <laughs> it's because she wants me to go first. I think that, um, you know, I, I don't, when I read the paper, I was like, well, what is the problem that we're trying to solve here? And, and it seemed like incredibly vast and big um, in the sense of how do um, creating, creating proof of personhood in the manner that you suggested being incredibly labor intensive and sort of, I left myself being like, what is the problem you're trying Kalea, to solve? Kalea, before we get that, can we, can we, yeah, can we get to what, what would you like to solve? And, and what are your reactions to what Brian said he wants to solve, you know? Right, so I think, what do I want to solve? I mean, my mission has been around supporting the emergence of decentralized identity technologies and enabling institutions primarily, but also other people to, to say things about other people and have those assertions be believed because we know where they came from and they haven't been altered. So that's well, what I've been focused on in terms of a set of challenges to solve which is how does entity A say something about entity B and other people can read and see and see those assertions and believe them. And what do you think about the relevance of the problem that Brian 
raised the the that the notion that proving you unique personhood should be prior to that like what how does that strike you like what's your reaction to that claim i i um i i don't i'm like i don't follow the ball i'm like so what if business I can problem for who does it solve so, Okay, well, well, I, let, let me just get in Shireen first, and then let's circle back to Brian. Shireen, yeah. Yeah, so um, I think I know where the solving part is, I believe, but I'm not sure that I, I'm, I'm in agreement that this is the way to do it. So I, I, like, as I hear the whole aspect of, like, personhood and trying to hold my space as an individual and the data that does that before we get to what I'm going to, how I'm going to engage with the system. Um, I'm, I'm still hearing a couple of things, which is um, that in some ways, I may be able to identify certain things about me and, and my data points, but I still need external approval for who I am before I can operate in the system. And to me, that external approval is the one that I'm always, afraid, you know, I, I always find problematic. Um, and, and that part is the part that I, I, I get where we're trying to go because I, it, it makes me nervous in, in, in many ways because it's that external piece. Like I can identify myself in a certain way, but it's the part where, because some of us land here, like, I, I can I can only be the person that I am that I I'm claiming to be as long as the social construct of which I'm in identifies me that way too, and if it doesn't, there's no way for me to get past to that 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 place where I can do elections and have my digital identity in different ways, and that's where I have a problem. It's that it's that that's that marker that we have to sort of get by to get there. Um, I get the, I get Brian's concept of like, you still got to do your part first before we get into the social construct, but then I'm up against another interpretation instead of my own. Well, so let me, let me try to sharpen it a little bit. So like what I understand is Brian is saying, it, the most important thing is that we establish systems that can say, you're a person, you're a separate person, you're a separate person, that that's the fundamental thing that we need to do. And that that's more important to and prior to the ability to say anything about ourselves that goes beyond simply saying that we are a separate person. Do you think that that, do you agree, Shireen, that that is like a more fundamental thing? Or do you think that some of these things that Kalia was talking about, that like we be able to sort of assert things in a socially trusted way about ourselves, that that's a more fundamental problem? What's your reaction to that? So, so yeah, it, it feels like I still have to get approval for my identity before I can assert what my identity is. So I- I think I that's a property of both what Kalia is saying and what Brian is saying. Yeah. I think both, but, but what they're then, but what they're trying to say is that Brian is focused on systems that create social consensus or proof around the notion that you're a unique person. And Kalia is interested in focusing on things that go beyond that or, or she, she thinks that those are more primary, which is that some set of people says something about me. So the, the, the question is, do you, do you view one or the other as more fundamental or is there something else that you'd like to see us try to achieve with these systems? I, I would like something probably a little bit of a combination of the both instead of the, the either or, um, because I see flaws in both, right? There's, there's, a, there's a systemic problem with both of these things. I, I, I do understand the need for that, that sort of individual, that tight individual frame, um, but it's, it's only to connect to the system. Outside, if I wasn't trying to connect to the system, I wouldn't need that tightness. It would just be me operating as an individual in the way that I see myself or the way the society operates with me. Yeah. So I, Ryan, let's come, I'm going to come back to you in one second, but I would just give my summary, which I think most aligns with what Shreen said, which is that I agree with Brian that, that a crucial goal of any system like this has to be the capacity to prove our unique personhood in particular situations. But I think I agree with Kalia that I, I don't think that that alone, if a system does that alone, that it has much utility or maybe any utility. Um, like just to take the example that you gave Brian, um, 
of you know bots attacking a system. Like given that most votes that I'm you know interested in online maybe have like 300 likes or something like that, I think that the difficulty of me creating a bunch of bots versus the difficulty of me going to a bunch of Russian citizens who don't care about the issue anyway and having them completely overwhelm those 300 is very very small. And so to me, like the in almost every practical circumstance I can think of. Um, the question of mere personhood is mere, mere unique personhood is of basically no relevance. That's that's my. I mean, I'm not saying it's literally no relevance ever, but I certainly don't think it's going to get us very far on issues that I care about. So that that's my basic reaction. Okay. Um, yeah. So so that's reasonable. Uh, I have to push back that uh, uh, on that though. Um, do you do you remember Usenet? Does anybody, so so this is, you know, great, great. Yeah, so <laughs> a piece of largely forgotten history, you know, the first big, you know, decent, fully decentralized public, you know, debate forum where, you know, you know, it was truly censorship resistant, you know, anybody could post anything, you know, it still kind of exists and works, but it was completely drowned by spam, right? You know, kind of there was a, a spam and abuse of all kinds. So, you know, um, so, you know, it technically worked, but there was no uh, there there was no way to to stem abuse or to self govern uh, ultimately content behavior or anything right. So it basically collapsed because of that, and we're facing. Uh, you know, the whole online ecosystem is facing, you know, just a, a new iteration of that. Even platforms, uh, you know, the, the big platforms run by companies with a lot of money and a lot of people trying to deal with these problems still can't, right? Do you, so do you remember when Wikipedia was editable by anyone uh, without having without creating an account, or do you remember when news sites used to you know to try to experiment with with having feedback uh, uh, you know columns online right you know below every every news site you know um, you could uh, you know people could react and ask questions and and things like that. Right, well, I, I think we all agree with everything you're saying. The question so, is whether unique personhood yeah. alone does much to so get us past those issues. The, the, the thing is, uh, all, of these, uh, all of these problems are um, uh, result from uh, abuse being uh, uh, basically in, um, uh, uh, infinitely um, uh, amplifiable, right? You know, kind of if, if it was only, you know, a couple miscreants here and there, then you know you block them and you ignore them or you know the website blocks them wikipedia blocks them whoever you know you know you block them and they you know ideally they can't come back and you know problem solved in a few minutes the pro the real problem is the amplification factor the the fact that they can and do come back immediately and continue the abuse and continue amplifying the abuse you know and, and it doesn't even it did, you know i don't mean to overblow the the issue of bots it can just be normal people who are uh, who are being jerks and you know immediately come back and continue harassing, continue you know doing whatever they're doing, right? Um, and if we had uh, you know if we had just just merely a way you know to anytime say we're browsing the web, any website we get to, we automatically you know kind of with or with one click at most get a, a one per person account, an actual writable account where we can write to Wikipedia, we can write comments on news articles, you know, things like that. But it's, but it's one per person, or at least very close to one per person. So, so if we abuse, we get blocked, we can't just immediately come back, right? And that, so that's, um, I think that that would be, you know, that alone would be, you know, fundamentally transformative of the uh, of the whole online ecosystem, right? J just as a starting point. Leah, what's your reaction? Do you think that would be as transformative as Brian thinks it would be? Um, maybe if it was buildable, but I'm not sure it's buildable. And so then the question is, how do we? You know, and and also, I I don't think that I don't think that you solve these problems without community governance and systems of moderation and uh, absolutely not. And, and but, that but most then governance of these problems possible. are actually completely addressable with good online 
systems design to prevent abuse and negative behaviors in the first place. Yeah, I, I also, I, I will go further than you because you weren't willing to actually, Shireen, do you, do you agree with what Brian said? Do you think it would be transformative if you could get a one account per, per person? I, I don't, uh, no, <laughs> I, so, simple. I, I think that it's not, it's not even for me, I, I have so many other questions. What would be the one personhood identifier that is blockable enough to not allow them to come back with other parts of their identity? Well, I think I think we're going to get to that in a moment, and I, I want to put the issues of how we build this for a little bit later. Okay. But I, I just want to talk about the goal uh, for the moment. Like, if um, do you think it would be transformative if we, if we could ensure that people could get like one account per person? I personally, I still see I still see problems here. Um, I just, just FYI, like I, 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 like I'm already on the like how you, how you, how, how are those identifiers happening first? Um, I do get why this is the issue. I mean, we like especially today, like I'm really working on the whole fake accounts and pretending to be black and brown people and um, you know interfering in elections and things like that. So I, so I'm very much aware of like all the problems that this that that I think Brian is trying to solve for. I just don't think I, we're, we're in agreement on how to do that. And oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, and and that the, to me, it's like um, it sounds to me in a way that we're trying to do this. It's like a biometric, like my fingerprint is my only fingerprint kind of thing. I, I know he, he's saying no. I'm just saying that yeah. that I don't think that's the solution he's going to propose. But um, right. yeah. but but I, I think the question is, is the goal worth achieving? Um, I don't know if you have any more comments on that. And we'll turn to his solution in a moment. Um, um, I think the goal is something to think about achieving. I, I just see flaws already. So I'm, I'm, I'm already at the other end. So I'm going I'm to stop there so that we can kind of get. To well, so I'll, I'll just give the sharper view then, Brian, which is I don't really think the goal would achieve much. That's my view. Like I, I, I think that um, if you could get fully to your world of one account per person, I, I think it would probably reduce by some small percentage or increase the cost by some small percentage of doing the kind of abuse you're talking about. But I don't think it would, it would fundamentally change the landscape because I think, as I mentioned, in most of these forums, there are not like a number of people that's similar to the number of people on earth. There's a very small number of people involved and therefore, bringing in just sort of like other unique human beings who are, you know, confederates of yours would be sufficient to overwhelm the forum and create that sort of chaos. And in fact, we have lots of examples like that. I actually want to turn to Shireen's examples. Like, I think there's probably bots who are out there harassing black and brown people. Um, but my guess is a lot of it actually is people just go to like other people who are not part of the situation at all, who are other, you know, white you know, supremacists, buddies of theirs, and that they all just pile onto the forum uh, with no like basis for having been there. And that that's like, there's already some impediments to just having a bot create a million accounts. So it's often just easier to just do that. And that already happens. So like my guess is most of the abuse that we're worried about is a result of the pure community governance issues that Kalia is talking about, rather than the like fact that people are creating. Now, I'm not saying there aren't bots. I think there's lots of bots. I just don't think like that is to me the the primary source of, of the problems that we're facing right now and or in the context you were talking about in the past, Brian. But that, that's that's my reaction. Hey, uh, fair fair enough. But uh, uh, can I ask you a question? Uh, do you uh, you know do you think uh, a self govern online self governance mechanisms like say quadratic voting could be transformative in the long term, right? Uh, absolutely, in, the, in a context of broader community governance. Like I don't think quadratic voting okay. as a mechanism and a pure formalism, you know, with completely open to all people in all circumstances is likely to have a lot of benefits. I right. think uh, mm -hmm. embedded, like as as a part of a broader social construct, I think it it could be quite powerful. Yeah. So so and the re you know the reason I asked that is is because you know that is a, actually a great example of a mechanism that doesn't that simply doesn't work 
you know, reliably, unless you have, you know, some, some basis for deciding, you know, who gets a vote, who gets how many tokens or whatever, quadratic voting tokens, whatever you want to want to say, um, being able to dis, uh, distribute them in some, uh, you know, arguably e equitable fashion. And also, so, so you also address the coercion issue or the, you know, kind of just recruiting a bunch of friends or buying a bunch of help from, from you know, people willing to, willing to be shills for money or, you know, uh, that, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, that problem has to be solved too in the, you know, to, to, to solve self-governance. So, that, you know, the view of digital person that, uh, that, that I have, like the goal, you know, that we need to solve includes, you know, both, you know, ensuring that, that, you know, our systems can have a way to count anything one per person reliably and make sure that, that uh, you know, the use of those tokens, whatever, is actually, um, you know, is actually based on their free will, do, uh, you know, doing something to counter coercion. Now, I know, you know, I'm talking about a hugely hard problem, and I, I'm very well aware that, you know, Shireen and Kalia are very skeptical that, you know, either that maybe it's solvable at all, let alone that, you know, I am, that, you know, my proposed, uh, you know, solution will work. Um, and why, why know, don't we move on to that now a little bit? So let me, let me do it in one step. So, um, Brian, in your paper, you identify some properties that you would like a system that achieves this to satisfy. And I'm interested yeah. in Shireen and Kalia's reaction to those properties, as well as their own ideas about some of the properties they'd like to see in a uh, digital uh, identity system. So why don't you go through those, Brian, and, and we'll turn to Kalia and Shireen. Okay, sure. Yeah, so ju just to summarize, um, the, the, four, um, uh, the, the, the four properties to me that seem most, most fundamental in uh, you know, in what I care about most, which is enabling online digital self-governance, you know, and, and these other things, you know, would be nice too, um, is first of all, inclusion, equality, security, and privacy. So inclusion, meaning, you know, everyone, every real person should be able to easily and cheaply, you know, uh, you know, without having a lot of specialized knowledge or, you know, you know, anything special or excluding, you know, should be able to, you know, get access, you know, in this fashion, right? Uh, you know, get, get full, um, you know, rights as an online citizen, uh, you know, to, to anything associated with, with personhood, independent of, you know, what attributes you might or might not have, right? So, so that's inclusion. Equality means there should be, you know, everyone should count as one, one unit, one vote, one follower, one like, however, you know, whatever you're counting, um, uh, you know, if you're trying to, to count one per person, everyone should have equal, equal power, equal vote, equal influence, equal baseline rewards, you know, when you are trying to count people, right? So people should have fundamental equality in that sense, right? So, and so the third, of course, is security. Uh, there should be no way, you know, no uh, viable way, any, you know, sufficiently clever, sufficiently determined, sufficiently uh, rich attacker uh, should be able to, say, create a bunch of uh, a few or, or, or especially a lot of fake personhood tokens, uh, you know, or fake identities in which to, you know, uh, to abuse or stuff ballots or, you know, do whatever, right? Uh, and fourth, privacy, right? To me, that's, that's really critical. Um, you know, p participants should have privacy by default. They should not be asked or expected or coerced to reveal anything about themselves, right? Unless they want to, unless it's truly their free will to reveal, uh, you know, this or that attribute, right? And there should always be by a, a by default option to reveal nothing, to say, I am just a unique person. You don't know anything about me. I am gonna be fully anonymous, but I have full rights as a, as a digital citizen. And I don't have to agree to, uh, you know, to reveal anything in order to exercise those rights. So to, to me, that's the, that's the privacy goal. Now, and uh, I again acknowledge that it can seem, you know, almost inconceivable that we could actually solve those all at once. But, but I let, let, let's let's leave that to one side yeah. for the moment. Mm -hmm. Kalia and Shireen, um, what are your reactions to that goal set? 
or do you have other goals to propose yourself? Clea, you and I wrote a paper with sort of a parallel um, set of I, things. I mean, I think that yeah. those, like, who doesn't like those goals? They're like mother and apple pie, yay. <laughs> so, um, and, um, but I think there is a, um, I think for our early digital, like, I think in terms of, where we want to go with digital democracy it's not in the abstract it's in the particular and it's either in communities of practice and interest that people have something in common that are widely distributed geographically or it's in the very particular and geographic at the neighborhood or the city level and then attributes like where do you live actually matter to supporting digital um, discernment and dialogue and and democracy if we go all the way to voting. So. Shereen, what are your reactions to what Brian said? So oh, he gave summaries. And, and so I, you know, I have a couple of things I want to highlight in some of these areas. But um, again, in, in terms of the umbrellas of each of those things, we, we, I would say we will all agree. There'd be no question about that agreement. Um, I still have, I would still have questions about how, how each of those things would, be, would occur if, and, and, and how they recur even all at the same time. I, I always get nervous at this point because this is the point where like under inclusivity, it's like you have to be stripped of all the things that make you, you to be seen as a part of the system, right? I, I know I would try to do that. But, but, but that right there is where my alarms go off because what, what we're saying is we, in order for us to get to that sort of level of equality, we have to flatten our person. And that, and that flattening part to, to be put into the system is where I just go, yep, yeah, no, now we're not, we're, we're, it's, now we're, we're not going to get there. And it's not because I don't agree with the one person, one vote concept, but that when, but once we do that, and, and, and I've, you know, I've been in this community long enough to know like why, why we try to come up with this, it, it, it's, it becomes that then we're the data point again. We're just, a, we're just another number to do that one person, one vote thing. And all the other pieces that make us us is removed from the system. Um, and so like, I, I, you know, I, if, if, I don't want to go into the details of it, but the ways in which, uh, even uh, the way Brian describes uh, what inclusive means, it's like racism has to be removed, gender has to be removed, you know, all those things of citizenship has to be removed, um, because we, I, I am concerned about the stateless, definitely, but that becomes part of the problem, because now we're Never mind. We, 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 now we're at, adding a different set of identity to, to make sure that we're flattening everybody else. And that to me is where we start to kind of tumble in the, in the problems here. I, it, like we're trying to solve a problem and then we're, and to me, like in that particular category, we're adding, we're now adding a problem. So just, just for the record, I'm not proposing to flatten people say, or to, to you know, strip people of all of their you know attributes. I am definitely not at all against you know people being able to reveal themselves and prove things about themselves and you know do the kinds of things the self self sovereign identity wants. What I care about is making sure it's actually self sovereign that there's actually a real choice that it's actually um, you know your real consent that you know. Uh, that, that, and I don't think that will ever be the case if you don't have a choice not to, right? I think, you know, the way I see this self-sovereign identity ecosystem going is, you know, if it, if it, if self-sovereign identity becomes the standard thing without an underlying layer of digital personhood, say, then every website you visit, you know how every website you visit these days asks you, sends you to a cookies disclaimer, you know, cookies stuff first, right? After self-sovereign identity becomes ubiquitous, every website and online service you ever visit will first 
ask you, hey, you know, we need your basic information, this, you know, basic information, the essential, uh, you know, identity information, just like, you know, they currently ask you for your, you know, acknowledge that we're going to keep essential cookies on you, right? And, you know, I'm not sure exactly what that essential information is that they're going to demand, but they're always going to demand it, especially anything, whoops, sorry, uh, especially anything, um, you know, non-trivial, like, you know, uh, God forbid, trying to, you know, trying to get a bank account or something, uh, uh, something like that, you know, you're always going to be asked for, you know, uh, for pieces of digital identity as a condition for participating at all, that's going to be trackable, that's going to be privacy invasive, right? So what I'm advocating is merely that we actually ensure that people have a choice, or an effective choice, either to disclose part of them, uh, you know, what they are, or not to. And again, you know, if you don't have the digital personhood baseline, you don't have a choice because the the only way to get the effect of the personhood, you know, without you know without the underlying layer is by disclosing some kind of proxy identifier, an email address, a phone number, a social security number, something a government has verified as a effectively trackable proxy to your identity. And, and, you know, and then you don't really have any choice anymore. Right? So Brian, Brian, Kalia wanted to say that your properties were motherhood and apple pie, but I want to push back on them because I actually think that they're not, not, not quite the right properties. And then in fact, they're not even necessarily all desirable. So like the privacy point that you're making, you're saying that, look, um, people are going to be required under self-sovereign identity to disclose a bunch of stuff other than just their unique personhood. And that's undesirable. So my, my view is that that will also be true if they also had a proof of unique personhood that they could add on top of that. I think that there's essentially no service that any service provider would be willing to provide to you in almost any context based simply on the fact that you're a human being. I, um, I did. So that's that's my that's my view. Like I I, I don't I don't think a bank is going to be willing to provide a service to you on the basis of that. I don't think a nation state is going to be willing to provide a service to you on the basis of that. I am entirely confident Microsoft Corporation would not be willing to because I work for Microsoft Corporation and I've talked to leaders there about this. So, so uh, yeah. Sure, sure. Okay. So let, let's forget the bank example, but let's talk about, you know, an ordinary website uh, that, uh, that, you know, once, normally wants you to solve a CAPTCHA before you do something, before you sign up for an account, a Wikipedia, or a, you know, commenting on a news website, or participating in an online poll, an online vote, an online quadratic vote, or, you know, anything you might want to do, right? Where, you know, there's a lot of cases where sites and services you know, want to want to make it easy for pe people per, uh, to participate. You know, want to want the barriers to participation to be low. Want it to be open. Blockchain cryptocurrency systems would like, you know, everyone to be able to, you know, participate. Be a miner, a validator, whatever. You know, everyone who wants to, but they need a, a, a you know, some barrier to entry to make sure that, you know, the you know the first person, uh, you know, determined attacker doesn't just take over, right? Um, and, you know, this is, again, a, a, a absolutely, uh, you know, ubiquitous problem, and it does not require anything but, uh, you know, solving it does not fundamentally require anything but a, a pro proof of unique personhood of some kind. It doesn't require you to disclose anything about yourself. So anyway, let that, I think we've covered that, and I want to get to questions soon. But first, Brian, I want to give you a chance to describe your proposed solution and get Shireen and Kalia's reaction to that, given that especially Shireen was really focused on the solution end of this. And I'd love to hear how she reacts to your, your thoughts about the solution. Sure, yeah. Uh, so, so I think, you know, I, um, I, I wanna, uh, so I think, uh, you know, I wanna acknowledge that there are a number of uh, pr potential approaches and, uh, you know, mine is not necessarily, you know, is not, uh, by by no means the only one. There's a whole sub community springing up, uh, you know, in this space of trying to explore different, uh, interesting approaches to this problem, and I'm I'm super excited to seeing that. Right. Um, so, you know, my my approach is one of many, and in fact, you know, for for a long time we've had, uh, you know, there are there are well established governmental approaches that try to achieve this, you know, for. Um, you know, either just via documented identity, you know, uh, 
uh, things like that. There's India's Aadhaar program that tries to tries to do exactly this on the basis of, of biometrics, uh, which you know is a solution. I think an incredibly problematic, creepy one person personally, uh, but it is an approach to uh, you know to to uh, doing digital personhood. You know. Um, uh, and uh, uh, but then, and there are of course social network based approaches, trust network approaches uh, that, that that are very popular, uh, being explored in the blockchain space. Uh, you know, and I I think those are very interesting, but also problematic in different ways as well. So I you know I wanted to acknowledge these diff different approaches, I, but you know to me. Uh, it uh, it feels what feels most essential is we need to get back to the the, the foundation that real people uh, have at least for the moment have one real body each right so we we have to um, you know kind of acknowledge that we are embodied beings and and the you know the foundation we need uh, in terms of uh, in terms of ensuring at least equal rights equal baseline participation online is is basically a one body one one vote or you know one body one one token proper property in some way right um and you know of course there's various ways uh, you know ways to do that um the approach that uh, that i uh, you know proposed back in you know 2008 and and have been developing um uh, a little bit more recently um uh, uh, further uh, it basically goes, uh, you know, goes back to the basics in that sense. Uh, think of it as analogous to in-person voting, which is, you know, uh, which is, you know, still the standard way to vote, you know, uh, uh, outside of pandemics, let's say, um, you know, you're expected once in a while to go to a, a particular place at a particular uh, time, you know, and do something in person to, uh, uh, you know, uh, to um, you know, participate in uh, you know in democracy, say you know in uh, in a traditional democracy. So, um, so my uh, but my proposal here is let's just change that a little bit. Let's say well we're still going to ask users, ask people to do something in person once in a while, not all the time, but we're going to you know ask them to sacrifice a little bit of time and convenience once in a while to go to an in-person event, but this time not for voting. You don't, it, it, we actually simplify it, right? So do something like voting, but even simpler. You just go to a, 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 an in-person event where, you, uh, where you're, you're there merely to prove that you're a real human being with a real body. And, and this is a transparent event. Uh, but it's but it's kind of, but it doesn't need to be privacy invasive at all. You don't have to you don't have to show ID. Brian, Brian, just to just to be clear, clear. I, I understand from your proposal. You imagine there being like a small number of these around the world happening, something like once a quarter or so. So. Oh. So, so it could be a small number. It could be a large number. Uh, so, you know, if it, uh, if it, uh, you know, got to be a big thing, um, uh, you know, it's, it's the idea is, uh, you know, any small community in any neighborhood anywhere that's, that's, uh, that's interested could self-organize these things, right? The, you know, these little events, um, they can, uh, you know, uh, that, uh, that could be run at very low cost. Uh, you know, anywhere there's uh, there's a, a, a th you know some threshold of people interested in uh, in doing them, they have to be synchronized, right? So so the key is, um, uh, uh, you know, at least uh, within a federation, let's say. So uh, so you know you have to you have to pick or organize you know one event you know in your area, be there by a particular deadline, you know, um, in a in a designated space. Uh, you know, at that deadline, you know, the doors or entrances close, uh, nobody else gets in, um, and, you know, you leave uh, people, uh, you know, leave, file out one at a time, getting a QR code or uh, 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 scanned or something like that. Basically, you get a digital token. We don't need to uh, worry about the details at the moment. And just, just from the fact that you were, you know, you had only one body, you can't be in two places at a time. Uh, means whichever of these events you chose to attend, you can only be at one, you get one token from one event at your choice, right? And, um, and they don't say anything about you. They don't have any- Yeah, uh, so Brian, after... going, going to the uh, for, furthest opposite extreme, rather than focusing on the properties, let's just assume that all the properties that you talked about 
our properties yep. to this event. I just want to be clear on the event. So like what I'm imagining is, imagine there's like tens of thousands of these, event, maybe even more, hundreds of thousands of these events happening, uh, synchronized. Yep. Um, roughly quarterly. And a significant chunk of your ability to be part of sort of the digital world, which is increasingly becoming the world, depends on your, in a synchronous way, quarterly attending events like this. Is that fair? Fair description. So I, I, I think I don't, I, I don't think anything bad, you know, particularly bad, would or should happen if you miss an event or two. Uh, you would, you would merely lose, um, basically, your voting power. You know, during you know for for one period, let's say, right? So, but yeah, you know, so so this would be uh, the expectation for you know if you want a right to vote, a per, you know basic participation. But you also described right. described universal basic income, so access to social for services example, might also just depend on this. It, perhaps yes. So, um, so I, I'd love to I, get Kalia, and I just want to get a crisp on, on it so that the audience can understand, and I'd love to get yeah. Kalia and so, so basically reaction. like you know, showing up to vote. It's optional, but, you know, but there's not just one benefit, not just the, you know, the, the benefit of like feeling good that you participated in democracy, but, you know, a whole bunch of things, uh, you know, being able to- uh, you and, know, and it would be roughly something like quarterly, is what, was that? is what I understood. It was something could, like quarterly. Could, could be quarterly, could be yearly. There's there's trade-offs in, you know, for in different periods. But if it was, year, but, if it was yearly, then you, for, if you failed to show up for a year, you'd then lose. It would, yeah, then it would be a bigger deal if you if you failed to show up. And Kalia and Shireen, I'd love to get your reaction there. This seems a lot of logistical. Oh, Kalia? Her, her uh, why don't we turn to Shireen first? I think sure Kalia's internet is too weak. Shireen, why don't you go first? Yeah, like yeah. the scale and cost of I don't think she can hear us. She's going to have to mute her. Oh, I think she just muted. Shireen, why don't you go ahead and we'll okay. wait for Kalia's internet to improve. Yeah, she was, she was frozen there for a second. So, um, so the, the showing up part, I already, like, I'm already like, oh my goodness. Um, and, and, and only because, listen, I, 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 I get it. It feels like it's like just really simple thing and this simple moment. So the, the showing up part is the part that I'm already kind of like, I, I understand how it sounds simple, but I just feel like it doesn't get at the fact that if someone doesn't show up, then all of a sudden they're not in the system anymore, right? Like they, it's, it's almost like, um, it, it's like, I, I, in my head, I'm going, like, we already have problems with voter ID issues, right? Like, like it, and it just feels like it's just another layer in, in, in terms of that. Um, it, it, I, I, I understand that there are government systems in place right now that people still have to do. And I know that there, that's kind of where this line is going. It's, it's sort of like, this is still about things you still have to do anyway, if you have to show up for, for um, any other forms of identity or, or bring, in the, bring in the birth certificate or whatever in, in person to, you know, piece of that. I get that. Like, I, I understand where we're going. My, my, um, can I ask another question then? Like, cause I feel like- Please, Shereen, absolutely. Yeah. So if they miss the, if it's yearly and they miss the yearly thing, what happens at that point about their in integration in the system? Let me ask that question so I can, I, I'll get that part out of my head. Sure, yeah. So so I expect, you know, nothing much, not, you know, nothing too bad. So um, the, uh, you know, you just, so like I said, there, I envision many, applications of this right so if you're if you're using it as a baseline for a, ba a base a basis for a you know universal basic income for example in a in a cryptocurrency or in a government well you miss that basic income payment right so that's a that's a financial loss in that case right so um uh, and, if, and then in some if, and, but even in those cases that could be devastating like that got, that could be yeah life or death that could be not i would perhaps. agree with Shereen. Right. so like so, that, that i mean that's not just a minor or, or, or like, if it is minor it was like that's just minor it's it, that's, yeah. or, that's or if it is minor brian i i would think that yeah. then the question is is there anything useful that the system is facilitating like if being not in the system doesn't actually do much harm to you 
then what benefit to you are those systems to begin with? So, so let, yeah, let, let, let me come back to that, right? So, let, you know, that, that's just one example. Like, you know, come, come back to the, uh, um, the uh, you know, say, say social media example where, uh, you know, you might, you might have, you know, many social media accounts. You don't just lose them or, or anything. You don't just, you know, kind of get out of the system at any rate, but instead, uh, you know, if the if the social media, you know, are, is counting real people in terms of followers, then, you know, every uh, everybody you follow on Twitter um, will have their follower count decremented by one for the next quarter or the next year until you get your personhood token, your next personhood token, and then and then, you know, their follower count increases by one again. Right. So you just don't count toward, you know, reputation st scores like follow scores or something during the period that, you know, you don't, you, mi you missed out on your token, right? So, so that's another example, right? So, you know, the world isn't, uh, hopefully, you know, it's not the end of the world, right? Um, there's, um, uh, you know, other examples like, uh, like being able to use uh, personhood tokens to get past, uh, uh, to avoid solving CAPTCHAs. You know, I, I think it could be both a much more effective and much more, um, you know, inclusive way to, to, you know, to deal with the same kinds of abuses that CAPTCHAs are using. So, you know, uh, so if you, if you don't have a, a personhood token instead, well, you have to go back to solving CAPTCHAs to do whatever, you know, you were, you were doing, right? So, so there's, you know, you know, what happens, of course, depends on the application and the, and the use case, you know, and, and it could be, you know, you know, more important in some cases and, uh, you know, and less important than others, depending on, depending on the application. Now, I also want to come back and, you know, point out that, that, you know, this participation, this kind of participation, I see as, you know, this, this would be the common base case baseline. This does not mean it's the only way to get a personhood token and that no exceptions are possible. I think, you know, if this became a widespread thing, we would of course have to deal, figure out how to deal with exceptions. Of course, there's gonna be emergency workers, all kinds of people who can't get to, uh, you know, who are totally realist, real people and want to participate, but can't get to the thing because their job doesn't allow them or they're bedridden in a hospital at the time or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? There's gonna be a bunch of, you know, kind of necessary exception cases. And, you know, there are ways to handle those as well, as long as there are exception cases, uh, you know, uh, uh, then, then they can be handled, you know, it can be either more expensive or, you know, to handle those, or maybe a little less privacy, a little bit more privacy invasive. For example, you know, if you can, uh, you know, if you would like to uh, be at a, at a personhood party or a pseudonym party, but can't, but you can prove you know, your location at that time in a very transparent way and just prove that, you know, you are a real person that and was not at any of those those parties, then, well, you're you're basically giving up, you know, there, there could be a mechanism for doing that. Nope. You're giving up some of your location privacy at that critical moment in exchange for being able to participate in a, you know, in a, uh, you know, way out of the ordinary uh, path, right? So, Alia, do you want to, um, I'd love to get your reaction to if your internet's stable now. Yeah, I think that the, the organizing, oh, the internet went unstable again. <laughs> Am I back? You're okay. Yes. No. Okay. Um, the, the organizing burden just seems incredibly high and I'm, I'm, you know, I just don't see the, the, the upside benefit. And also, you know, you, we've just talked about the downside risks of like, if you're going to base a UBI on it and people are excluded, that's, that's devastating. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I would I would really put together what Shireen and Kalia and, and said because I think it it gets to my basic reaction to this, which is, on the one hand, you can have not that much depend on this, in which case it seems to me like it's an enormous amount of work, and an enormous uh, coordination challenge, and sort of like a whole new change to people's lifestyles for like something that doesn't really play that much of a role. 
And at the same time, it seems to me like if you make more depend on it, then it it could be quite um, devastating or exclusionary in practice, if not in theory, because there, there will be a variety of people who will struggle or who will be concerned about showing up at a place at a time, et cetera. And in fact, countries that have mandatory voting, mandatory in-person voting, have relatively limited penalties for those, precisely for this reason. Um, so any, anyway, it, it, um, th that's, that's how it strikes me. Um, and as I mentioned, you combine that all with the fact that I don't think that there would be that many applications where this would get you a good chunk of the way towards what you're actually needing in order to improve them. It seems like it's not a, a direction that I think is something that should be central to solutions in this space is my guess. So uh, for me, just Brian, just really quickly, and, and I'm trying to round up where I think where Glenn and um, Kalia was going. Um, if the token, if, if, if the minor thing is like, I'm going to use a CAPTCHA, then the token means nothing to me. I can just use the CAPTCHA all the time. I don't need the token, right? I don't ever have to do that again. And that the energy to do that or to, to focus on that. I'm just giving that because you gave that well, example. I'm just except the CAPTCHAs are getting harder and harder even for normal people because of because of ai you know yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So I, captions are themselves becoming exclusionary elements in the online ecosystem right just see, as an example right but even even that what glenn just said even this what, what, what you're suggesting can as much as you're flattening these identity issues it, it, the, the the ways in which this would operate it would still based on other people's identity issues, health, uh, whatever, you know, um, I, I don't want to even go into all the, or finances, wealth, like you, you have all those things that, that you want to flatten, but those can be the very things that keep them from showing up. So it's like, even though, even though it, it, you're trying to be completely in inclusive, the, the way in which to, 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 the burden of trying to get this token would still have the, the wealth part would still still have an impact on that as much as we're trying to say we're being very inclusive like it's there it, it's a very um you know it, I always feel that, that when, when we think about these things this is why I say about uh, what why why we why we can't take away our identities part coming into this because it 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 may seem like a very simple thing but but it still takes finances to get to the place to get the token and some and it seems minor but some people don't have that like we like we like one of the things that we're having problems even in the voting system aspect and, and plenty of and plenty of other places is people move in polling places from accessibility from certain people who cannot get there no matter where where those places are so i i know that i know that you're thinking more more simply that this is they, they can be community organized or the case may be but even that trying to get the community organized to do that is another is, an, is another burden for that piece so i so if it as again this is i this is why i said it earlier the minute i see we ha, we are removing all these other identities from the system you're also removing all the all the problems that those identities present from the system too and then, the, you, then, then once the system is quote unquote in place with this one person, one one person, uh, you know, one person, one vote kind of uh, token identity, we're, we're now we're now saying, oh, this should have been simple. Everyone who came as they are should be able to do these these very simple things, and that takes away all the other barriers from the system. And that, and again, that's that was like my immediate reaction because that that that's I already felt it. I knew where we we're going. And I was like, and, and because of that removal, um, that level of removal, the, it, the system itself becomes, um, uh, it becomes, um, um, it, it becomes a biased system. It, it, it becomes a system that will exclude people, uh, w whether it's meant to or not. Yeah, I, I, I really identify with what Shireen said. Rand, I want you to respond very quickly, but then I'd also love to really turn back to Shireen and Kalia and get their perspectives on whether they have thoughts of directions for solutions to this general area that appeal to them more and that they'd like to, to point people towards. Um, yeah, so, so, I, uh, so I, I hear that, you know, most of your, your objection is may, your objections are mainly just on the feasibility of 
organizing you know these kinds of things make uh, um, you know widely enough often enough access make them in, making them accessible enough right uh, you know the cost of organizing um, uh, so you know let, and let's even go back to the you know the tougher challenge let's say we want them quarterly so that uh, so that uh, you know you don't uh, you don't miss out on that much if you miss one cycle for example um, so uh, uh, I happen to I happen to live in Switzerland, uh, and here you know a standard practice of, of the direct democracy mechanisms is they regularly vote have votes, um, uh, you know initiatives and re referendum, uh, you know four cycles per year, basically quarterly, sometimes more often, right? And these are these are really huge operations of you know kind of edu uh, you know getting these things on the ballot, educating people on you know what the issues are, uh, you know organizing the actual votes, etc. Right. So of course, and of course, it's not perfect. Of course, it has um, you know there are there are issues of uh, uh, of you know participation and and you know things like that, but. I'm just, you know, using this to illustrate that it's it's already a thing, a kind of thing some governments do. It can be done, not just uh, you know once every year or two, but on a quarterly basis. Um, and and actually, in some you know cantons here in Switzerland, they do this these quarterly things in person by you know showing up and raising their hands, yay or nay, and you know things like that. That's that's the exception rather than the rule. But you know the point is there is actually precedent for doing you know more complicated, more difficult things at you know this frequent uh, this this general frequency countrywide for what I see as a lot less potential reward, right? Where you know you're you're just contributing to one or a few decisions, most of which probably don't don't really affect you directly, and and it's it's really hard to get get people motivated, you know, to show up and vote or you know do anything in that basis. I think you know if you could show up once a quarter and get you know the key to a whole bunch of different benefits, right? Uh, you know, both minor conveniences like being able to skip captures and like being able to get, you know, anonymous but writable uh, logins to any website you visit and etc. Uh, ability to, you know, participate in cryptocurrencies as a, you know, as a voting member, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera, as well as, you know, eventually, not immediately, but eventually more bigger, you know, bigger things like, you know, like potential government supported uh, 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 services, right? Right, Brian. Um, I, you know, I, I, so, so the point is, you know, having one mechanism that unlocks, you know, one, uh, you know, periodic inconvenience and cost that can unlock a huge variety of potential benefits. You know, I feel like, you know, we've got to start somewhere, but eventually it, it could be so a very, Brian, very- Brian, I, 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 think, I, I, think, I, think, I think we've gotten a picture of it and I think we should move on from just uh, pushing back against this particular proposal. And I'd like to get a little bit more to Shireen and Kalia's uh, broader visions and, and to bring in a question from Paula Berman, which I think is relevant to this. Um, so both whether you have Kalia and Shireen, whether you have broader things to say about, you know, systems that you think are more appealing, you want to point us towards, but also Paula Berman asks, can you outline more accurately what you mean by community governance or good design in online spaces and what sort of practices those would entail? I'd love to get your vision of both the governance part and, and some of the other systems for these identity issues that you'd like to point the audience towards. Um, yeah. So I think that um... If we're, you know, I'm an expert in digital identity, and I also am a designer and facilitator of interactive in-person events. And if you're going to go to all the trouble of getting everybody to go to something, you should at least have them do something useful while they're there. Which That's is part of my proposal, actually. So, so I, I fully envision, you know, these events should be something where okay. there's, you know, other reasons to be there as well. But that's yeah. a separate. Brian, Brian, can we hear? Can we hear? I would love to hear Kalia's perspective. But that's not what I read in your paper. I read people walking through a funnel and getting a token, right? And that, so that is that was in the original. That was in the original 2008 paper that you probably didn't read. So, so th this was a follow up to that. Sorry. Kali, I, I, let me just hear your positive vision. I mean, whether whether or not over the positive Brian, vision yeah. is um, 
you know, I think that um, we need to support greater online dialogue and deliberation amongst people who are living together in shared geographic regions, but also have common interest and practice. And that the path to this is, you know, through, um, you know, good community online governance. And I'll let Shireen um, take the baton and sort of articulate some of those best practices. Yeah, I'd love to hear what Shireen has to say about that. Yeah, um, I would say, I, let me just say right now, as far as where we are in online governance, we failed. Like we're in, in the <laughs> dystopic fr framing of that. I, there's no question about that. And we we need to do a better uh, piece of this. Um, I, I, the, the thing that like, that I would say in terms of like, what, how, how would I do this differently? Um, I feel like when we think about community governance or online governance, I think that we still need to have a set of agreed upon um, acceptable standards that, I'm sorry, my camera went off. I'll, I'll be, uh, you can still hear me. Um, uh, accepted community standards. What we've done so far is that we've, we've, we've accepted community standards for certain groups of people. And we do that because we, we also think that we're flattening that, right? We, we, we honestly, this is part of the challenge that we have. We honestly think we're, we're, we're trying to flatten and, and that the rules apply to everyone in the same way. And that has not been the case. And so when I think about community governance, I think about it from the perspective of like, if, if, this, if, this, if this standard uh, has a different response to a, a, a different group of people. Uh, so for example, let me just, uh, can I simplify this? I'm, I'm, I'm going to do hair. I'm a black woman with hair, right? If there is a, if there is a grooming standard or community standard that um, um, the way people come in the door, uh, that, that they have to uh, uh, check off a certain uh, business or attire framework, and you don't look at those policies and see if that it dis disproportionately, disproportionately affects another group of people, then we can't, then we're not in the same place about that, that sort of community governance. There's an assumption that there is no other uh, problem going on. Um, and so like now we have laws to, 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 to say that people can go in with their hair the way it's naturally growing out of their head, right? Like that, that, that level of not understanding that policy and that, and that community standard. So when I think about community governance, I think about all the pieces that, and to me, this is the hard part because I think this is the part that everyone wants to remove. It's all the pieces that make that, those disparate engagement in the community um, um, problematic and coming up with some kind of standard to, to deal with that. I would say that we think we have standards. I think that I, I, in terms of what I see, in terms of the way we engage in community, but but even the, the reporting systems, uh, the, the, the fake account pieces, we are not actually engaging in that system in a way that can solve can can do the solve at this point. So Sh Shireen, what, how do you imagine that? I'd love to hear yeah, what, so, your, what direction you'd like to see things move. The, the, the way I think that, my opinion is if we allow the leadership of those of the most marginalized to come up with those standards, I'm sorry about my camera, y'all, um, to come up with the, with the things that, if we start at the margins of, of, the, of the problems that people are dealing with and apply that across the standards for those that are the most privileged, I think that that could get us to the solutions that we're looking for. What I always feel like, and I, I, I say this all the time, we start with the most, um, the, especially those who are building the systems, we start with the people who are sitting at the most privileged position and say, hey, we're going to get the rest of the system. The, we're going to design the system so everyone else who's coming into the system we, will we'll shift as we go. I think that the problem is we need to do it the opposite way. We need to do it from the, from the edges and, 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 then, and then include, include and be more inclusive of everyone else. And that's so, why I'm always nervous about the inclusion part where it's like we want to remove all these, th all these things from it. I think the, that in itself we need all of those things to, to figure out where the most marginalized sits, where the most problems exist that we can solve for that will be beneficial for everyone else. The way in which we think about accessibility, like the curves, like we like people didn't understand why that, the curves that were, were for people and the bumps in the roads and the curves, that once you focus on the person, the people with the margins, with the, the, the people with disability, then the curve that, that bump helped moms, you know, with their with their strollers, you know, it it, it became a, a community system that actually helped other people. And, and for me, when I think about this, we're always trying to remove that layer because we think that if, if that layer is too complicated to solve, and, and I see it all the time in these papers, and I think we need to do the opposite of that. I think we need to start with that 
with the marginalized group, the human side of all of our problems, the good, bad, and the ugly, and then build the system out from that. Can you give me an illustration of an example, either of that happening in practice or of a proposal that you've heard from those communities, something tangible that, that people can put in their minds to think of when they think of that type of a solution? I have so many things, use cases going on in my head right now, and I'm just like picking, I'm trying to pick one. Um, I would say if I had to think about um, a system right now that I could base it on is that one of the things that I've seen happen with the work that we do is that the ways in which the reporting system disproportionately impacts Black women uh, on these platforms, like the, the things they can and cannot say are disproportionately changed. I would say I would go to those women, uh, help them design what that reporting system community standard would be, that would be more, more useful to them, what they're, what they're being impacted with, and, and, and implement that in the system. Uh, I would, I would, that wouldn't even be just the AI perspective. It would include, um, it would just, it would, it would include a community that could deduce what the best solutions can, would be. Can you give me an example of something that came out of a process like you're describing that you thought was, you know, important and made a difference or, 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 or even a concrete proposal that you've heard someone make that hasn't been implemented that you'd like to see? Yeah, I, 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 I probably am not describing it properly, but like a system like get 10 women who have, who have experienced the most severe online harassment, because <laughs> this is my, my space, um, the most severe online, online harassment, the, the, the spectrum from, from, from the, the, the slightest to the most severe, have them uh, come up with what the solution should be in terms of like the, the punishments, the, the recourse that, that needs to fall underneath those and have that. Yeah, uh, so Sh Shereen, I hear that and I completely agree. I'm just cu curious. So that's a process, but like, is there an actual system that, that was designed through a process no. like that? that you would highlight as having been a no. good exemplar or? No, that, that's, those are the systems I want built. They haven't been built, exactly. Sorry about my camera. A anywhere, there's no, there's no il illustration in any local community. Kalia, do you have any examples? The, the thing is, I think people are gonna have a challenge identifying with that without an exemplar of, of that, you know, of something coming out of that that was, compelling. And I mean, I have my own thoughts, but I'm interested in, in Shireen. I would also Shireen. like to propose something when it's uh, a yeah, appropriate sure. time. I, I'm, I'm, I'm being very honest. I, I, these are things I've, I've seen as use cases and suggestions that have not been implemented. Do, do you have any examples, Kalia, like that? Yeah, I think um, not at scale. I mean, I think self-governing communities that are pretty small are great examples. The, the challenge we have is not, you know, how do, you know, the world I live in, how do 500 identity experts chit chat about identity while we self-manage, right? Uh, but how do we scale that to platforms the size of Twitter or Facebook? That's where we don't necessarily have the answer. And I think, you know, the research points to smaller, more commons where people are mutually accountable to each other systems than trying to just scale up to the large size. But I agree with Shreen's point that we should be centering the folks who are impacted negatively in today's systems and invite them to be the designers of the next generation of systems. So Brian, do you wanna offer your suggestion? Yes. Then I wanna pose one more question from the audience. Yes, uh, yeah, thanks. So I completely agree with both of you, Kalia and Shireen, that, that you know, self-governance is, you know, community self-governance is, you know, is, is at the heart of many of these problems. And also that there are very few answers, you know, solid answers that, you know, are actually working out there or even, you know, seem plausible at the moment, right? I also fully agree that, you know, the, the marginalized absolutely have to be 
you know, central and, and included in that, in those processes. And, you know, we need uh, to develop better standards and stuff like that. But can I, you know, come, uh, you know, even assuming we have standards, let, let me, let me focus back on the online space, um, you know, about say, say just the specific problem of deciding whether a post, a tweet or something is appropriate or inappropriate say, you know, does it, you know, does it uh, satisfy community, the standards of this community uh, or not, or, or, uh, you know, um, some set, set of standards? Well, how do you do that? You know, currently, you know, current platforms hire armies of people to do it, you know, kind of in a way that's, that's basically unaccountable, very opaque, uh, you know, partly by, partly manually, partly by, by algorithms that they don't disclose, etc. Um, you know, Facebook has tried to make it, you know, paint a fig, fig leaf of transparency and independence by creating this, uh, this, fa uh, this Facebook oversight board, etc. You know, but, but all of these, uh, you know, the, these decisions are, are, you know, not self-governance by the communities themselves. They're, they're by, you know, uh, they're, they're by basically, you know, appointed guardians of, uh, of one, yeah, yeah. one factor. So, right? Brian, could you get to so, your... So here, so here's an example, you know, way we could uh, we could do that, given, say, a proof of personhood foundation. So suppose, um, uh, you know, suppose somebody flagged a post as, you know, as inappropriate, where that may, may that may or may not be true. That's uh, let's say we want that that to be something the community judge is not a not a small self-selecting community, not just the people who pile on, you know, definitely not, you know, kind of the, the friends of whoever does it, likes or doesn't like this thing, right? But we need, so, you know, some level of independence. Well, there is actually a, a very classic way to do this, right? Trial by jury, random sampling to get a representative sample of, of people involved. The question is, who do you sample, right? And and this is becoming a, a a more a bigger thing in political science circles as well. The idea of sort, sortition based mini publics or citizens assemblies. Can we do those things online? Uh, and these are truly scalable. They're because they're parallelizable for any given issue. Like you know, does is this particular post appropriate or not? What should be the you know the next you know community standard for this or that issue? So you can, you know, you can sample, you know, a body of, uh, of people get, uh, you know, get a, a set of volunteers to actually debate that out, hash that out, you know, online or in person, but you've got to find it, you've got to have a way to, of sampling, you've got to have a list to sample from, you know, and a way yeah. to make the, make the selection process transparent, right? And, yeah. and, yeah. And so, so Brian, that, I, yeah, I think I think, I think that's a good idea. A way to give give that basis that, that I, I, we need for those kinds of scalable online. I want to turn. Mechanisms. I want to turn back to Clay and Shereen and ask them, um, your, the governance practices that you were talking about, which uh, were very interesting. How do you avoid those being hacked by fake IDs? So, like, let's go back to Brian. Like, how do how do you deal with the problem of impersonation? How do you deal with the problem of non validity of those? Uh, of of the the people trying to be part of that, whether it's Shireen's um, participation by um, marginalized women, you know, like if you put the power in those people's hands, how do you avoid once that becomes the source of power, people just pretending uh, or hacking or faking th their way in? Shireen, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, this is, I, I think that this is like, even the personhood thing is something we're, we're worrying about. Like, I, my personal opinion, almost everything can be hacked, right, or hackable in some form. That's, that's always been my opinion. Um, but in terms of this, I think that um, this goes back to how do we verify who these people are, and what are we going to do for that verification, but also, um, like, who has access, who knows, and to me, that's kind of where that privacy part comes in. It's like, does, do, do, does everyone need to know who these people are? Um, I think there's an argument about transparency there, but I'm not sure that everyone needs to know who those people are. And so I think that that makes us dance back into this conversation about privacy and data. Um, but that, um, I, I, but, but that if we want to prevent the hacking, there's, cert there's a certain level 
of anonymity that needs to be there for, for, for that level of protection. But when you and, put in anonymity and you, so, so imagine we just say, I'm just, I'm, I just wanna be very sharp on this. Imagine we say, we want the, this set of marginalized communities to speak and design this issue. And that actually becomes a source of power because now they're gonna design a system and everyone else is gonna to have to live in that. What stops other powerful actors, if there's some anonymity there, from just completely flooding it, impersonating the people that you actually wanna be reaching and denying those people all the power that you just gave them? So, uh, Kali, I don't know if you wanna jump in here, but, but, but for, for me, it's just like, no, okay. For me, that the, the, the system itself, that's where, that's where this, 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 the threat modeling has to come in in terms of the security part of that. I mean, and, and to me, I just want to be clear, this is a problem that we're facing with all these other things. And so that's the question we keep running back up against. But I do think that, that we still have to have a security arm. Like, even though Brian, I don't agree with Brian's pers uh, personhood model, I do agree about the privacy and the, and the security part that has to be there. You can't, you can't. Well, I, think that, I think the key question that we're going in is that Brian is a security expert. He, what, what he's asking is, what is the security system that solves the problem and allows you to achieve your goal? if not what he's saying. And I'm not saying I agree, I don't think I agree with what he's saying and I have my own views about this, but, but, but I do think that the question is right, which is if you're dismissing a particular security model and you're proposing that we have a set of people govern it, but we have no security mechanism that you're comfortable with, it's gonna get hacked. So like, that's the question. It's like, what is the security model to protect the values that you hold, which I, I think I'm very sympathetic to. I'm sorry, y'all, my camera keeps going off. Um, Kalia, do you want to jump in here? So, I mean, I think in terms of online democratic um, engagement that I would like to see that we don't have a lot of right now, I think it's city-based um, governance, uh, city-based deliberations that can you know, enable all the people who can't make it to city hall once a week to go to to the council meetings, like being able to engage in. To me, that relies on existing identity systems like voter rolls and DMV registrations and getting people easy access to those attributes about themselves that are relevant to a particular deliberation and then using those in the process um, to prove that indeed they have the relevant attribute to have and you know, say in what happens in their city with other citizens of that city is is a key key and, thing. And, to... and do you think that could be extended to Shireen's scenarios of empowering, like say, African American women in a particular? But you she's know, talking about who design designs system. the system. No, no, right? but, I, but I'm saying I'm saying imagine we now are thinking about a system that allow like we're designing some other system, and right. we want to make sure that the people who we're empowering to design it are in fact the people from those from the margins like how do we make sure that powerful wealthy people don't just astroturf that um and undermine th that i think you get on video and talk to the humans building the system right like <laughs> well I, i'm not i'm not opposed to that either but you know i think brian would then say well what if there's some deep fake thing there where they pretend exactly to be, where they pretend to be a black a black woman and and they mask their voice and and, and all that sort of stuff like i i, I think that's that's where brian would head I, I, but I don't get me wrong. I agree with some of the, the the security parts of what what Brian is saying. I just don't agree about about this particular idea. Well, but, but I think Brian would then say, "Well, so what is the solution? Like, if that's yeah, not the I know. Solution, what is the solution?" solution. Yeah. And I think that that's a very real concern. And I, I so so I, I just want to get past the like what Brian's saying sucks because I kind of am, am not that sympathetic to it either, and get to like. So, so what is the solution space? And what I hear Kalia saying is for certain civic functions, we already have an infrastructure there. Let's just take that online. But I don't hear other than let's get on Zoom and assume that there's no deep fakes, which maybe that's the answer, um, what the solution is to ensuring that we're, we're focused on marginalized communities and not getting astroturf. I also am not even sure that the, the online thing works and it, Brian's thing wouldn't solve it either because you could end up paying a bunch of and this happens all the time with astroturfing, paying a bunch of people who happen to be African-American women, but are actually representing the interests of someone who's powerful yeah. To, yeah. to claim that they're speaking for the interests of African-American. I mean, that, that happens all the time. Conversion resistance is critical. You know, yeah. So, you know, 
anyway, th th there's a lot of really challenging issues here. No, no, and, and, and that's why I thought this conversation was going to be interesting because I knew that they were going to go back and forth about these challenges. But you're, I mean, you're right. See, the thing, the thing that I would say is that we're always, and, and it goes back to some of the work that Kui and I do, is like, we're always assuming that no matter how, what system we build, that the humans in the system are going to be utopic and do and be all these good, and, you know, and, and, and operate in the system with, 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 with good faith. Um, and what, and, and the reason why we're in dystopia is because we're pretending, we've been pretending like the bad faith stuff doesn't still happen. And so, and so as we're having this, I'm sorry, my camera keeps going up. Um, so as we're having this conversation, the part of the social threat modeling piece is to, is to make sure that we, we solve for all those possibilities of, of, of the human side of, of, of that going awry and trying to come up with a solution. Well, and I think Brian is really focused on that in a very aggressive way, maybe even too aggressive. So there's somewhere in between. Um, but anyway, I, I don't think we came to any resolution. I think we we got clarity that Kalia, Shireen, and I are all skeptical about Brian's proposal, but we I haven't heard beyond the civic application good approaches to trying to solve the problem. So I guess we're still, there's still an open question here. Uh, I also, and I'm looking I also think that his, his, his area is not only more aggressive, but it's trying to add into a system that already has some things in it that could, we could be using. And that's probably probably my approach to it. Um, I, like the way Kalia brought up the voting part, but I think there's, there's pieces of the system that already exist that we can be using instead of trying to create a whole new system, a whole new ecosystem to solve for a problem that like some, we already have some solutions for it. I'll just- I'm I'll very, try. very sympathetic to what you said there, Shireen, as well. So anyway, th thank you all for an excellent conversation and looking forward to many more exchanges going forward. Take care, everyone.